Yay! Hooray! <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, so this is the uh, new room for uh, my Matrix talk, uh, which I amusingly titled uh, Red Pill and Blue Pill, and I see a misspelled pill there, so that <laughs> everyone can laugh at that. Uh, that's a good one. Um, this is the uh, template, uh, the Fedora template, and it has some interesting quirks to it. So you'll notice that my title is like kind of split into two places. I, I don't know why it did that, but it did. Um, so let's uh, talk a, a, about disclaimers and a little bit of, about the title of this talk. Is that sound volume okay? It's sounding very loud to me, but uh, is it okay. All right. Uh, so first, first of all, uh, just as a disclaimer, I'm not a core matrix contributor. I'm just a user of matrix and a sysadmin who uh, helps run the Fedora instances. Uh, I also run an instance myself. Uh, that's my primary user is on. Uh, there's only like three users on it. So uh, it's, it's interesting to run it from that perspective uh, at home. And of course, if you get any, if you see anything that I get wrong here, please let me know. Um, there are a lot of weird subtleties, and Matrix is very complicated, uh, so I may have missed something. But I tried to go over everything uh, and uh, avoid that. Um, so just a little talk about the, uh, the metaphor, the the talk. How many people here have seen the Matrix movie? Is it everyone? Almost everyone. Um, so you, you know the metaphor of the, the blue pill. Take the blue pill and then you will go back to your mundane life and be ignorant of, of how the world works. Or take the red pill and just find out how everything works under the hood. Uh, and I thought it was an interesting metaphor for, for this because uh, there's a lot of people who want to just use Matrix as a, a user. They want to use it as a communication platform. They don't care about how it works. They just want it to work uh, they want to be able to communicate with other people in a, a more synchronous fashion than email and whatnot. Um, and on the other hand, you have people who want to know how it's put together, how it works. You know, we're, we're all technology nerds. We, we like to see under the hood and see how things are put together. And open source allows us to do that. You know, all this stuff, uh, is, the code is there. You can dig through it. You can figure out how things work. And it's just generally kind of interesting. Uh, I also put a, a Wikipedia link up here. Um, there's actually a long history behind this uh, red pill, blue pill thing. Uh, most people know it from the Matrix, but it actually was set up long, long before that, this dichotomy of you know living in the world and not caring what it's like or learning how the underpinnings of it w work. So I encourage you to go take a look at that Wikipedia page if you're interested in the history, the etymology of, uh, of that particular thing. So what is matrix? Um, so one thing you might notice is that I, I say, what is matrix? I do, I'm not saying what is the matrix. Uh, so we're not talking the movie anymore. We're talking about a protocol. Um, matrix is a protocol for real time communication. It's not only a protocol for text, but video, audio, People have built all kinds of things on it, as you'll see here later in the talk. Uh, it's federated, which means that anybody can make an instance and federate with all the other instances out there, uh, talking back and forth and synchronizing the communication between them. And we'll talk a lot about how that federation works kind of in the second part of the talk. Um, <clears throat> this protocol is built on top of sort of the modern internet. So it uses HTTPS, it has a RESTful interface, uh, uses SSL certificates, uh, nothing too strange. They just left all those lower level details to the regular transport that already exists out in the world. So federation takes place over you know, HTTPS connections between instances um, and they verify their certificates just like any other uh, web service and so forth. <clears throat> a few terms uh, to talk about here. Uh, the first thing is everyone has a home server and that's the instance that your particular account is on. Uh, could be matrix.org, it could be fedora.im, it could be just whatever instance that you set up. Um, 
So every, every user has a particular home server that their account exists on. That's the place that you authenticate to, to log into your account. It's the place that stores a lot of data, metadata about your account, as we'll see later. Um, and it's uh, the place from which you join other places to, to federate back to your server. Uh, in addition to a home server, you have a username. And so on your home server, you're at user on your server name. So, you know, at Kevin Fedora.im is a particular user. Uh, and this disambiguates it. You can only have that user is unique per server. You could have that same username in a different server, but there's only one of those users on that particular server. Uh, additionally, there's devices. Matrix calls them devices or sessions kind of interchangeably. But you can have as many devices or sessions as you want. You could have, be logged in from your phone. That's a device. You could be logged in from your web browser. That's another one. You could be logged in from a, a particular application. That's another one. You could be logged in as many times as you want to the same account. They're just separate devices or sessions attached to your account, authenticated to your home server. Um, so, <clears throat> also as a term, uh, everything in Matrix are rooms. So when you send a direct message to somebody else, it actually is just a room with you and the other person in it. Or if you join a public room that has a whole bunch of people talking in it, that, that's another room. Um, spaces, which we're going to talk about uh, here in a minute, are also just rooms. So spaces are actually rooms that contain other rooms or references to other rooms as an organizational uh, topic. So let's talk clients a little bit. Um, so how many of you here, well, how many of you here are using Matrix, are logged into Matrix ever? Yeah, pretty much everyone. Okay, now how many people are using Element as their client? Uh, most people. Are you using Element as the matrix client? Yep, okay. So Element is kind of the reference client. It's uh, the kind of default that everybody uses uh, initially. Um, it's developed by um, the matrix uh, organization. Uh, so everyone kind of really starts out with that and it does have a lot of features. It, it implements a lot of the uh, spec. However, there are lots of other clients, and they, some of them implement more features than Element in certain cases, and less in other cases. It's very uneven. There's no particular uh, spec for a client. A client could implement part of the features, or they could implement everything, or they could implement their own features, or whatnot. So it's a little bit confusing, because you have to kind of look at these clients and decide, you know, are the things that this client does better than this client, or you know, what do I want to use here? Um, I did a couple of years ago a roundup of all the clients in Fedora, and I'm actually working on another one, so I'll probably have that posted soon. But there's probably around a dozen clients now that you could use in various uh, states, uh, some of them having better features than others. For a long time, a lot of the clients didn't support encryption, but that's not true anymore. Most of them do at this point. So the point is, use the one you like best that you're most familiar with. Um, if you're unhappy with Element or there's some feature that you want that it doesn't have, then you can certainly go out and look at the other clients. If you look on matrix.org, they have a whole list of all their known clients and all their known servers. Um, and you can go check those out. Most of them are available as RPM packages in Fedora. There's a few that are only available as flat packs, but that's fine. And there's a couple that are not available readily uh, in, in Fedora. So. so as a quick start, if you've never used Matrix before, uh, we have our own pair of servers, as I will talk about here in a little while. But the place to go if you want to just join as a user, chat.fedoraproject.org, log in with your Fedora ID, and then that's it. It'll pull up the Element web client. It will join you to the Fedora space, which will be a collection of rooms. Uh, and you could search for rooms, join rooms, uh, open messages with people, everything uh, 
you might expect to do. Uh, and of course, you can use uh, a separate application, Android client, whatever, with the same credentials. With one proviso, we use uh, a single sign-on type of uh, authentication. And there are a few clients that still don't actually support that, so you are unable to log in with those clients. Most of them do anymore, so that's not a, a great barrier at this point. Um, so a few interesting side effects or interesting things as a user uh, of Matrix. Uh, it may surprise some of you to realize that your notifications are actually uh, set and managed on the server side. So I don't know how many of you have seen this. If you have, if you're logged in onto your, your phone on a mobile client and you're logged in on your desktop, and somebody sends you something that notifies your phone and you look at it and you go, oh yeah, I'll do that back when I get to my desktop. You get back to your desktop, there's no notification. Well, that's because your phone has acknowledged that notification and your desktop client saw that the server had already, no you had already notified it on the server end and it's gone. <laughs> so that's an interesting little gotcha that uh, hits a lot of people. Yeah. So, uh, that's what the behavior I expect. And I'm very annoyed when it doesn't work. And uh, Telegram gets it right almost always in my experience, but uh, Matrix get its, get its, get, gets this behavior right I don't know, half of the time, I think. Wow, okay. I mean, especially if the connections are iffy, then it will lose the notification state constantly, and that's uh, I don't know, surprising. Yeah, there's definitely still some bugs around notifications. I occasionally get ones where somebody notifies me and I can never get rid of that notification. It's just, it seems like it's always there. Um, they've been trying to quash those bugs as, as best they can, but yeah. Since this is stored on the server side, your client is basically saying, hey server, here are the things I wanna be notified for. The server is telling it when one of those events occurs. But then there's some kind of state issue or federation issue. So yeah, there's, there's definitely bugs around that. So, um, so yeah, the, the notifications thing is kind of a gotcha for, for some folks. Uh, another one, <laughs> I have a, a nice little li list here. Uh, I don't know how many of you have encountered this, but uh, when you direct message somebody, you send a message to somebody else, it creates a room it invites the other person into that room, and then you can talk to them asynchronously, just like any other room. That's great and all, but I have seen numerous times where somebody does that to me. I'm asleep, and so they send the invitation. I'm asleep. They don't see me join the room, and they go, oh, he's, he's ignoring me, and then they leave the room. So then I get up, and there's a notification that I should join this room, and I try and join the room, and there is no more room <laughs> because the person has left the room. So there's strange uh, corner cases around direct messages like that. Um, also direct messages are invite only and encrypted by default. So if somebody leaves the room, you have to invite them back. And if, you, if there's no one to invite them back, they can't ever go back to that room. So. Um, Occasionally, people uh, still run into encryption issues. I, how many people here have seen the unable to decrypt message thing? Yep, quite a few people. Um, I'm gonna talk about the encryption stuff here in a little while, and it's fairly complicated, and I think there's still, unfortunately, a lot of bugs around that as well. Uh, I got one the other day, somebody messaged me and sent me a whole bunch of lines of unable to decrypt this message. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't know what you're saying. So that's not good. I talked about the, uh, the read state issue. Um, I, I have hit that even in this last week. Usually clearing your cache will get around those problems, but occasionally there will be things that say there's a notification that you've seen and that you cannot actually get rid of it. Um, but they're, they're working on quashing those. And the final one that's a, a big gotcha that uh, some of you may have seen is if you try and join a really popular room with a lot of people in it, it takes a really, really long time. And uh, part of that is just due to the way the Federation stuff works, which we'll talk about here in a little while. But that's a real 
annoying problem that they run into. Uh, some rooms like the matrix.org has a, a matrix room that's like kind of a default room. I don't know how many people are in that anymore, but it's almost impossible to join because it's so gigantic. Um, luckily, most of our Fedora rooms are under two or 3,000 at most, so we don't really run into that. So as a user, I'll throw in uh, a few little, little known things here. Uh, you are able to set room-specific names. So every account has a uh, at account name uh, server. That's your official identification. That's how people can message you and find you. But you can also set a name, like a real name or a nickname or, you know, uh, my name, I'm out to lunch or, you know, whatever you want. You can also do those room specific. You could say in a particular room, I want my name in this room to be different than the, my room and my name in all the other rooms. So uh, that's a, a cute little thing that not many people know. Uh, you can also convert direct messages to rooms. So if you start a mes message with somebody and you're talking about something, and you're like, oh, boy, this other person would be really interested in this conversation. You can just invite them into that room and it will convert that direct message into a full-blown room that is uh, just like any other room that would have been created. And they will get the history back uh, since, the, uh, since the room formed, unless you change that. Also, video and audio calls uh, generally work these days, although there's some quirks around the, the video calls. But uh, there's widgets for those, and Matrix is designed to transmit those sort of things as well. Um, I know some of the teams in Fedora have been using the video calls for uh, SIG meetings or uh, teaching sessions or all kinds of things like that. Uh, so those are uh, interesting. It's using actually Jitsi under the hood. Um, so it's a, it's a fair, fairly solid thing and fairly well integrated. So now I'd like to, well, let me stop there and go back here. Uh, so are there any like usury blue pill sort of questions that anyone has thought up at this point or should I dive straight into the red pill underpinnings of things? <laughs> Why don't people just use IRC? <laughs> yes, I, I actually have a slide on this later. I'll wait uh, for my answer later. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we, we can answer it later. It's, it's a discussion. <laughs> So as someone who also loves IRC, um, what is the best CLI client that's uh, in, in Fedora right now that we can use to access the matrix? Uh, I think, it, well, it's subjective, you know, obviously I don't know what your tastes are, but I think WeChat is probably the best bet at this point. Yeah, it's a plugin. There's a plugin. I've also heard uh, decent things about a CLI tool called GoMux, who someone who yep. used to be like a big IRSSI, however you pronounce that user in the Ansible community, I believe, has been using that recently. Yep. Sure. So I had a slightly different question. Uh, you, you can convert the direct messages into a room and invite people. How does that interact with other direct messages to the same person? Um, if, you, if you do that, if you invite somebody else in uh, and then try and direct message the person again, it will create a new direct message room. And it, it just will start treating that room with the three people as a, just a room, not a direct message. So it will think that you don't have one to that particular person at that point. What, what was that? Yes. Yeah, you can actually convert a, a direct message to a room without inviting other people to it. There's actually a function that will let you do that. Just, yeah. All right, shall we get, head on to the red side? So uh, Matrix has a spec that actually describes the entire protocol. 
Uh, Spec.matrix.org, you can take a look at it. It's long and involved. Uh, but this is the thing that clients and servers work against to implement uh, the protocol. Um, and this spec is open and it's changed by MSCs, which are matrix specification uh, proposals. And there's a lot of these. If you go up and uh, take a look at the proposed uh, specification proposals, there's, uh, there's like thousands of them. There's a lot. Uh, so they're slowly working through those. I, I don't know how many they approve at any given time. But uh, there's a spec core team that reviews proposals after they've been uh, in a comment period for a while. Um, and adds them. So if there's something that needs to be added to the protocol, then they would use this process to change the protocol. Uh, as we'll see, there's, there's consequences of this. In general, they try and keep things backward compatible so that uh, if something just doesn't implement a new feature or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just not, doesn't work for that particular client or server. But occasionally they'll have to do something that's breaking that treats things a different way and they have a couple of mechanisms to do that, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, so just like Element is the sort of reference uh, client, uh, Synapse is sort of the reference server. Uh, it's written in Python, and there's a little bit of Rust also in it now. Uh, it's also AGPL'd now. Um, it's a pretty gigantic thing. Uh, it is in Fedora, it is packaged, so you, you can certainly install it easily enough. Uh, setting up a server is not particularly involved if you're just setting up the server itself, uh, but there is some documentation with Synapse. Um, there's a number of other servers that are kind of under development at this point um, in various languages and in various levels of uh, functionality, I, I guess I should say. Uh, there's Conduit and Conduit, I don't know how to pronounce that, but uh, the first one, it was a project formed in Rust, uh, a, a server project in Rust. The second one's a hard fork of that one with a bunch of patches and features on top of it. Uh, and it's a little further along, but both of those, actually all of the other ones, I don't, I don't know I would consider them really particular particularly production ready. They implement a lot of things, but not, uh, not a really complete server. Dendrite in Go and uh, Construct in C++, although I haven't seen a whole lot of activity at that point. Uh, I believe there's also another Python one. I didn't add it in here, but uh, since it's an open spec, anyone is certainly able to uh, implement their own server. Uh, there are a couple of commercial-ish products that implement matrix. For example, uh, Discourse, <laughs> which we have a, uh, an instance of, actually has a chat thing built into it that uses matrix protocol, which we do not have turned on to avoid confusion with our existing matrix stuff. But it does have a, a client in there for the, uh, for the uh, direct messages and chats. So let's talk a little bit about the federation. How does this federation work? So federation works by, uh, you know, you would think at a, a high level, oh, you have, a, a, say, 100 servers, they have to replicate everything to each other. That's going to be terrible. Well, it doesn't work that way. What it gets federated are rooms where there is a local user in that room. So if I'm a local user on my server and I join a room over there, then both those servers are going to be syncing that room. It's federated. It's basically federated to all of the servers that have a local user in that room. When the last local user leaves that room, it stops being federated. It actually gets cleaned up after a while from that server. So the federation takes place based on if there's somebody actively using that room on that server. Uh, all of the room is basically state events. So, you know, a room is created and it has certain events in it. And those events describe the entire room, like who is, has power level set, who joined the room, who said something, who did anything. It's this big JSON graph of everything that ever happened in that room. 
So when a client joins a room, it, it reads that event log and it goes, okay, well now I know who's in the room and I know the history of the last messages and I know that Bob over there is an administrator user because he has that power level and I can form the UI and, and show everything to everybody. So uh, as a consequence of this, if you want a room to be synced to your server, you have to have at least one local user in that room in order to do things like have a ad published address on your server for that room or uh, you know, basically sync the content of that room to your server. It of course means that if you have a user on your server that joins uh, gigantoroom.com over there that has 100,000 users in it, it means you're federating that room now and you're going to sync that room over to your server and it's gonna take up a lot of resources. So it is just text. Well, there is media also involved, which we'll talk about in a moment, but uh, there are a lot of resources uh, taken up by this. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the Fedora setup. Uh, we have two, actually two servers, fedora.im and fedoraproject.org. And so the users that join are given fedora.im accounts. So your user is at your username colon fedora.im. And we have also have a fedoraproject.org server with only a very few administrative users on it. And the reason for that is that we can then control fedoraproject.org rooms because you could not make a fedoraproject.org room unless you are on the fedoraproject.org home server. So this gives us a way to actually mark rooms uh, as official or whatever you want to call it. It also allows us to organize things in such a way that, that uh, it, it can be managed uh, by the, the admins of the fedoraproject.org server. Uh, also, the fedoraproject.org server is, is very small. It only has five users on it. Of course, it's in a lot of rooms, so it's got a lot of resources that way, but there's very few users there, so it's uh, not using resources in that way. Um, so any fedora.im user can make a fedora.im room. So if you make a room and you're on the fedora.im server, your room will be room name colon uh, fedora.im. So that shows that it's a community room made by Fedora, et cetera. Okay, encryption. Um, I'm kind of gonna go through this one quickly. It's, this is kind of a high level because the encryption part of Matrix is really complicated and scary. Um, so as I spoke about earlier, devices or sessions, uh, any user can have any number of devices or sessions at any given time. Also, you can verify a particular device or session, and that by that it means that uh, that session is known, and you can uh, you can trade your encryption keys with it, and you can also see that it's been verified by the user. So when you add a new session or device, uh, I don't know how many of you have done this, but if you, once you add that second device it will usually ask you if you want to verify it, and then it'll go through a, a verification process with emojis on either side, or ask you for your uh, encryption key, or some workflow like that, depending on the client. And in Element, you can see verified or not by a little shield on the side, and if it's red, it's an unverified device or session, and if it's green with a little check mark in it, it means it is verified. Um, you can actually set rooms such that unverified users will not get the messages, will not get, will not be able to decrypt any of the messages in that room. Uh, that's not commonly used, it's not the default, but you, it's certainly an option. Uh, when you're in an encrypted room and you send something, so you say hi, your client actually encrypts that thing to all the devices in the room and sends it to all of those. If they're verified, they actually have been syncing encryption keys, so it actually, they, they can all decrypt it. Um, if the room isn't set such that unverified users are blocked, it will also send to the unverified 
devices. So it's like a, a very complicated dance, uh, the keeping track of the, the keys. Each device has its own key. Uh, each thing sending sends to all devices in the room. It's rather complicated. So this is why the whole, the whole process has bugs in this area, unable to decrypt message. There's just a lot of layers to this as, as far as what it's doing. Uh, you can back up your encryption keys onto the server. Their element has a preference for that. Uh, I believe it's under security and privacy. There's a, a, a button you can set that basically says, upload my uh, a backup of my encryption keys and it'll ask you for a master password for those to encrypt them. Uh, your cross signing between devices can also be backed up to a server so that it knows when the device is gone and it comes back, you know, a month later it uh, is able to sync up those cross-signing keys. And of course, the, the master security key for the encryption and backup, obviously you wanna keep that in a, a, a safe place. Uh, you'll need that if you ever add a device that um, you have never used before and you are not able to verify it from another session. Like say your laptop broke and all of your sessions were on your laptop and you wanna log in again, you can log in again, but if you want that session to be verified, you have to have either your security key or a session to verify it from somewhere else, like on another device. So that's an a important thing to keep uh, backed up. So I talked about uh, breaking changes uh, in the spec. Uh, one of the ways they get around breaking changes is room versions. There's 11 so far, I think. Actually, maybe there's more than 11 now. I did this a while back. But um, each particular room has a version number on it and you can't change that room. It's that version number, it's created that way. Uh, newer rooms usually add features the older room just doesn't have for whatever reason. And you can, well, each room also has a internal room ID. You can see this in Element in the, uh, Settings advanced. There's a little section there that lists the actual room ID for the for the room, uh, and this is a in the form of a a bang and a UUID and a colon and a server, and it's very annoying to use this on the command line, of course, because they put an exclamation point in it. But uh, that is the actual des descriptor for that room. That's the actual room ID. You can name a room anything else. You can move, change the name, you can change the local addresses, you can change all kinds of things about the room, but that room ID always, always stays the same, and that room ID has that particular version that it had when it was created. You can upgrade rooms uh, by just making a new room and then marking the old room as uh, closed and it basically puts uh, what they call a tombstone event in that room. And the tombstone event basically pops up a thing that says this room has, has gone away, click here to go to the new room. And then it, you click there and it joins you to the new room. The new room has all of the uh, local addresses that the old room had. Uh, it has invited all the people that were in the old room over, but they have to click that button. It's not automatic. So there is a time period where some people are still in the old room and haven't, haven't clicked the button yet. Um, the room is still available, the old room. You can actually join the old room. And in Element, if you go to uh, the advanced section, there's actually a thing that lists, uh, look at old history for this room or something. And it will actually take you back to the old room if you want to look up some thing in there. You can actually keep jumping back in time that way if the room has been replaced this way several times. Um, occasionally, they recommend that you only do this when there's some particular feature that you need that's in the new version that is not in the old version. Um, usually, they're pretty minor things, so uh, it's not usually worth it, but every once in a while, there's some something that's more interesting. Uh, also, you can sometimes do this when a room is having problems, like there's federated users in it that are messed up or can't join or can't leave or there's some kind of state problem with the old room. Since you're starting with a new room, it's got a new uh, set of events and 
is it's just generally cleaner. Uh, so uh, matrix servers, Synapse in particular, uh, does have an API. Uh, there's an admin API. You can mark a particular user as an admin, able to use the admin API or not. If they're not, then they're just not going to authenticate to it. If they are, they have to use their uh, login token, which uh, is uh, associated with their client. Uh, but then you can do a bunch of things from the admin API, uh, a bunch of management type commands. Uh, you can do a bunch of queries. You can manage media like uh, pictures and files that somebody has uploaded. You can manage the history of the room so you could redact particular events or uh, particular user names or something like that. Uh, you can manage the room itself like by its names and uh, other associated data. And you can also um, do what they call as impersonation, which allows an, somebody with the admin API to uh, elevate privileges on someone if there's another user in the room from your server, you're allowed to basically use, impersonate them and use their privileges to up privileges of someone else. And I've used this a couple times when somebody hasn't made me an admin in a room and I need to go clean up spam or something like that. Um, so it, it is possible. But notice that this is very particular. The flow is very particular. You have to be an admin, have a local user in the room with permissions that you can use to do this. So you couldn't, for example, use this to uh, increase your power level on a room where there isn't any local user with privileges uh, anywhere. And this prevents feder weird federation problems. You can't, you, you can't use this to like change the state of your room on your server and try and federate it to somewhere else. It will be unacceptable. It just won't work because there is no way to have increased your power uh, level there and the other servers will reject it as, as a bad event. So they, they did design this pretty well. Uh -oh, low battery. Yeah, it's, it's fine, just it's close. OK, well, uh, good. They, they oh, yeah. All right, so um, there's a few other things that have actually been built on top of Matrix. Uh, there's a, a couple of collaborative docs uh, projects that are, and by this, I don't mean that they just added a widget that's a collaborative docs widget. I mean that they use Matrix as a backing store for their collaborative docs. So Matrix events are actually the edits to the collaborative docs. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. There's a social media uh, app out there called Circles that uses Matrix as its backend uh, store as well. And there's a whole bunch more. There's, uh, if you look on matrix.org under the miscellaneous section, there's a lot of people who are building strange and clever things on top of uh, on top of Matrix, um, just for the reason that it's a very uh, known protocol and it's real time communication. So they know that they can do this and federation, and so it's solving a lot of the problems that the, at a lower level that the application wants to uh, to deal with. Okay, so some rough edges for the uh, the red side here. Um, so let's talk uh, about uh, editing slash redacting slash deleting messages. So by default, users can edit any message that they, they have sent, and they can uh, redact them, so basically delete them. And that's fine. It's nice to be able to edit your messages, because if you make a typo, you want to correct it or uh, whatnot. But this sometimes causes a lot of confusion, uh, because <laughs> I can't, I think probably now about half a dozen times in the, uh, in the main Fedora channel, someone has joined, uh, I get up in the morning, I look at the channel, there's like 20 messages, 10 of them are deleted, redacted, and the other 10 are people answering the questions that I can't see anymore. So it's like, yeah, did you try this? Oh, no, go over here. Oh, yeah, that'll work. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, okay, now I don't know what their problem was or even if it got solved. Um, so this is a difficult problem to solve without removing editing capabilities because you could just edit your message to say nothing. <laughs> is that a client issue or a protocol issue? Well, the, the protocol allows you to do it, right? So, so could the client just say this message was deleted and then still allow you to see the former wording of it because it received it before? No, because what the way it does it is it's a protocol issue because it 
the message is sent, and there's the message, and then the person sends a redaction event. And so it basically goes out there and tells the server, that message was redacted. The server goes, okay, I'll delete it. <laughs> and you could change your server so that it ignored redaction events. There are actually patches to do that, but it's, it's not the, the common case. And even if without redaction, somebody can change their message. You can edit your message at any time, right? So you could just change your message to blank or whatever. Uh, also, I've seen sometimes people uh, joining a channel and saying something awful or provocative or whatever, and then redacting it. And so only people who were actually there and saw that message react to it. Everybody else comes and says, oh, it's a redacted message, and eh, whatever. But somebody who was there and happened to notice it before they redacted it would be like, hey, what are you talking about? And you're like, ah. So it's, it's kind of difficult. I wish they would set up the protocol such that uh, like maybe administrative users can see the redaction or you can uh, change the room so that redactions are not, a, uh, are not possible, but then they can still edit. Edit is always still possible. So um, it's just something to, to look at. It's not a, an enormous problem, but it also ties back into moderation issues, which I'm just about to get to. So, like on WhatsApp or Telegram, if you go this edit, Yeah, so I've never used it on Matrix, but on Telegram, WhatsApp, whatever, if you edit a message, the other person can like click on it and see history. It, does that not happen on? Okay. It does not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, that was, that was my first thought as to what it should do, but it doesn't do that. And maybe that can be changed, but yeah. So I think it would make sense to disable redaction on like public channels uh, in Fedora. Yeah, it might. Uh, but like I said, somebody can just go back and edit their messages yeah, to be nothing. Sure, but I mean, it would get rid of the problem that people will redact messages and then we, I mean, like, and actually, without thinking about it. And actually, on editing messages, I think you do, you are able to see the edited, the, the previous message. I'm not positive of that. I'd have to look. So maybe that does solve the, the issue somewhat. Five minutes. Oh, wow. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll cruise on. So let's see, we talked about deleting, um, moderation issues. Uh, so it, back in the IRC world, uh, we had bots that could handle things like flooding. Somebody joins a channel and spews like 100 lines of something. The bot could see them after five or six lines and go, eh, silence that person, whatever. Because this is federated, there is no way to handle flooding because messages can arrive at any sort of time. Maybe it came from over here and it synced to the server and then your server and it's, it's, there's not a really good way to, to handle that. Um, the bots in general, the moderation bots are improving, but they need a lot of work. Most of them work by um, sort of a reputation type system. Like we see this person spamming over here, we add them to this list, that list syncs out to the, all the moderation bots. And when that person joins uh, another channel, it goes, oh, this is that spammer, I can deal with them which is not great. Uh, there's a lobby function now, which we're not using in Fedora, which we may want to consider using, which allows people to go to a lobby room before they join any of your project rooms and have somebody uh, vet them, make sure they're not uh, malicious. I think that would be useful for cases where there's a lot of spam or other issues coming on. So here's the IRC thing. I know I'm running low on time. Um, so. IRC is great for people who have used IRC for a long time. We have our bouncer set up, we have our client set up, we have our logging set up, we're, we're all ready to go. But it's not great for new users. You know, you, you look at the instructions to join IRC for new users and it's, it's not good. It's like, install an IRC client, set up a bouncer, get a, a, a NICServe account, log into your NICServe account, add your no, 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 all this stuff, and then, Oh, don't paste long things into the channel. Uh, if you need to post a video or something, find a site to host it on, et cetera, et cetera. So really the whole thing I think boils down to just the fact that it's not so great for, for new users. And the new users are not gonna adjust to IRC. The IRC users are gonna have to adjust the other way, unfortunately. So I've used IRC for I don't know how many years. And in fact, I still am using IRC in 
places. But uh, yeah, it's 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 difficult. Um, let me see what else I can get to. I think I'm almost uh, done here. Ah, oh, yes, getting involved. We have a meta channel, which is uh, a channel where we discuss the setup of the matrix rooms and whatnot. Uh, everyone is welcome to join there, ask questions about the setup or rooms or anything, suggestions for improvements, uh, reporting uh, issues that you see. Uh, there's a bunch of future stuff going on in this area. There's been discussion right now. Uh, EMS element uh, matrix systems hosts our matrix servers, but we've been think talking to them about pricing and so forth, and maybe we're going to self-host or maybe we're going to continue with them. It's, it's all kind of up in the air at this point. Um, I want to set up an admin user to manage, automate management and get that a lot more... Uh, Feature proof right now, I've just been setting up channels mostly, and I've been putting my fedoraproject.org user in them so that there's a local user from that server. But uh, I need to set up a, an admin user uh, here. Uh, better moderation tools, and we do have a Fedora space with all of our rooms organized into it, but it's it could use some tweaking, so uh, I would appreciate any suggestions on that. We do have a, uh, there's a discussion thread on that on discussion uh, about how to better organize the SIGs and, and so forth. And so, questions and answers. <laughs> Did I run out of time yet? So, if I remember well on Fedora people, you have a cron job that we move MP3 and this kind of stuff because we do not want to be seen as distributing various material. How do you deal with that with uh, matrix users who are using end-to-end -end encryption and might copy stuff on their account but you cannot read due to end-to-end -end encryption? Um, so, the question is, is somebody doing questionable content or the question is um, somebody wanting to redact their stuff due to the... Uh, it's more how do you manage to not have legal say no, we do not want people to join um, file sharing at matrix not matrix org or something like this with our server. Right, so, so basically you're saying how do we prevent people from using this as a file sharing service of whatever questionable yeah. things. Yeah, there's some tools to do that. Um, with the admin API on the on the media, uh, but it's not great because you can list file names and you can list rooms that are things in, are in and size, but you can't. Um, in order to moderate those, you would have to download them all and like look through them to see what everything is, and so yeah, it's not great. I know. Yeah, there's a lot of issues like that. And as far as resources, I, I did actually look. There's four Fedora.im users in a channel that has 92,000 users in it. And I, 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 I used the admin API to list out matrix rooms and the most number of users. And it, that was at the top. And I was like, wow. <laughs> but, you know, it, on the other side of the resources with media, we have our design team has used their channel for ages and they post all kinds of mock-ups and things like that and that's using a, a lot of disk space. Um, but yeah, the moderation tools for Matrix uh, really need more work, <laughs> in my opinion. Anyone else? So I think oh, we are yeah. at time. Okay, wow. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>